The Cancer Assist Show, hosted by Dr. Bill Evans and brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program. Help when you really need it. Well, welcome to the Cancer Assistance uh, Podcast. And if this is the first time for you, I'm glad you're joining us because we're going to talk about a topic that's uh, very important from a cancer point of view. It's a very common cancer, colorectal cancer. If you've been listening in recent podcasts, you'll know that we've talked about breast cancer and lung cancer and prostate cancer. So this is the, the cancer, colorectal cancer, that sort of makes up the big four cancers, most common cancers we see in Canada and the developed world, and really accounts for about 50% of all cancers. So it's a significant problem, and I'm delighted that I have a guest today, Dr. Kevin Zabuk, who's a, a specialist in colorectal cancer, who's from the Jurovinsky Cancer Center and an associate professor in the Department of Medicine uh, at McMaster University. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you for having me. So I, I said it's a common cancer, and I, I looked at some Canadian statistics, and there's over 26,000 individuals can be expected to be diagnosed with colorectal cancer this year and, and, and every year, and in the U.S., because I know we have some U.S. listeners as well, well over 100,000 colorectal ca- co- colon cancer uh, patients and about 50,000 rectal cancer patients. So again, a, a, a big problem. And, and so it's important for us to be aware of of some of the causes for this particular type of cancer and what we can do to kind of prevent it if we can and or detect it early and, and then have a better outcome if we uh, find it early. So I guess a good place to start is a little bit about some of the, the risk factors for developing uh, a colon cancer or a rectal cancer and then we can talk a bit about the disease itself. So why don't we start there? For sure. So um, as you have mentioned, colorectal cancer is very common. And um, some of the common risk factors for colon cancer would be having a a family member with colon cancer. So if you have a father, mother, brother, sister with colon cancer, or the precursor to colon cancer known as colon polyps, that increases your risk of colon cancer yourself. So these are first generation, we say, uh, individuals, right? Correct. But you can even have broader... uh, uh, relatives, uh, aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and so on who may have colon cancer, and you might still be at a higher risk, right? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the greatest risk is if you have a first-degree relative, mm-hmm. um, but certainly more remote relatives would increase your risk as well. In addition, as an individual, if you yourself have had a polyp, and a polyp is not cancer, but it can sometimes become cancer. And so if you've had a personal history of uh, having had, had a polyp, your risk of col- developing colon cancer is also considerably higher. So I wonder if everyone listening knows what a polyp is in the bowels. So maybe we should just pause there for a moment. And, and there are different types of polyps, too, with different risks for cancer. So colon cancer will almost always start uh, with a polyp. And a polyp is a little uh, growth on the inside of the, the bowel. So all colon cancers actually start on the inside of the bowel or the colon. And then as they advance, they grow through the wall of the colon. And so a polyp is a little, you could consider it a little pouch uh, on, the, on the colon that has the potential to become a cancer. Very important to realize that the vast majority of polyps will not become cancerous, but some of them, if left long enough, will become cancer. So we're going to come back to polyps in the context of colorectal screening and, and talk about that further. But just wanted people to know that these are kind of little, initially benign protuberances from the bowel wall and that that some of them can uh, go on to become cancerous. So we'll come back to that. Um, But then there are things like diet and exercise and bad habits like smoking and drinking. (laughs) Absolutely. So um, risk factors such as smoking, um, alcohol, probably not quite as, uh, uh, as important in colon cancer as they might be in things like lung cancer, for example, but still very relevant and so important to our overall health and such big risk factors for many other types of cancers, still very important to try to control. You had mentioned diet. Diet is probably quite important, actually. And so a diet that is uh, high in fruits and vegetables, high in fiber, um, high in in the the vitamin folate um, is very good for you. And eating diets that are high in saturated fat, a lot of animal products, low in fiber, um, the really tasty stuff, the is processed meats that processed we enjoy meats. in our lunches. <laughs> yeah. Um, these are, are risk factors. And so diet can play an important role. Um, and linked very closely to diet would be obesity. And so yes. obesity is, is a very def- 
very consistent risk factor when you look at multiple studies for colon cancer. So in terms of trying to reduce your risk of, of getting colon cancer, there's some things you can control and some things you can't. You can't control your age because that's another factor, isn't it? As we get older, the risk of getting colon cancer goes up. Can't control the family we <laughs> got born into. Um, and certainly if there's hereditary aspects of it, we can't do anything about that. But we can do something about physical activity and obesity and our diet. And, and you mentioned um, um, you know, about alcohol and, and smoking not being as big, certainly as in lung cancer and head and neck cancer. But I was surprised to read in a, some publications that 12% of, of colon cancer was attributable to smoking. And I, I don't think most people are aware that smoking causes things like, you know, gastrointestinal malignancies or liver cancer. So it's probably worth mentioning. And it certainly, as you say, is part of a healthy lifestyle. So. Absolutely. I mean, many, many of these risk factors are so strong in other cancers. Yes. Um, and, and then in diseases outside of cancer that will be very important. So, yeah, uh, uh, active, life, a li active lifestyle, um, c trying to minimize the, the amount of processed red meat that we eat, focusing more on fruits, vegetables, fiber. Um, diabetes is also a risk factor, although it's very hard to tease that out. Yeah. from these other things like your diet and obesity and a sedentary lifestyle. But these are all things that we can work on for sure. Exactly. Now, are there some trends in colorectal cancer incidents that are um, interesting to talk about? I think there are, and particularly about young people sure. and, and maybe some of our First Nations people as yeah. well. Yeah. So if you look at the uh, it developed world, so the you know countries like Canada, the United States, Europe, that um, have very good screening programs, and we're gonna talk about screening for colon cancer a lot later, overall trends are starting to decline a little bit, which is very good to see. But what is, I would say, disturbing is a trend that we're seeing in many countries, an increasing number of young patients, and by young, usually defined as less than 40, who are di di diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And that is, that's been consistent about, uh, among many different populations in many countries. And what's the understanding of why this is occurring, or, or do we know? So we do not know. So it has it is, it is not been established why this is happening. With the uh, First Nations people, I, you know, I was kind of shocked to read about how, uh, how common colorectal cancer is in sort of uh, Alaskan natives and Inuit populations. Uh, is it some of it a change in diet to... Uh, to a more Western diet from what was a traditional diet? Absolutely. So I, 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 I would uh, suggest that in, in many Aboriginal populations, um, if you look 50 years ago even, their cause of death was often infection, poverty, malnourishment, um, and they ate a, a diet that was, you know, very different from ours, but probably still healthier. And they were very active and they often ate only what they needed to, to, to sustain themselves. And with the, the Westernization of or modernization of the Aboriginal population came some of the same problems that we have. And there are probably some hereditary differences that make them more prone to the same risk factors that we described. For example, if um, you know smoking contributes to 10% of colon cancer risk in a non-Aboriginal person, it might be higher um, in the Abor Aboriginal population because of different genetic makeup. So that, that is a, a very big problem. So I seem to recall, too, that there's some interesting studies of people migrating from areas of low incidence uh, to intermediate to higher, like if Japanese people move to Hawaii and, or, or, or to the west coast of, of the United States, that the incidence of gastric and colorectal cancer kind of shifts around Absolutely. incredibly. Yeah, correct. So these things are really powerful, and, and I guess you know, studies of diet and what people are ingesting are tr incredibly complicated to do, and I think it's partly why when you read about this, you don't get sort of totally clear direction of what you should eat specifically, but as you said, more fiber and, and uh, more fruits and vegetables, less processed meats, less red meat. Um, those are sort of the broad recommendations that we can make today, but there may be other things that we'll eventually learn Absolutely. about to be more helpful. Yeah, and the, the other group where um, the incidence has been going up a little bit is uh, um, in, in individuals of African-American ancestry. And what's very troubling there is they, they, their prognosis, their survival 
is, is considerably lower. And some of that could be uh, inequities in terms of access to, to health care. But even if you look at trying to tease that out, they seem to have a worse out- outcome anyways. And it, it appears there's something more aggressive about the colon cancer in those individuals. One of the things I also stumbled upon preparing for our chat was the fact that um, different populations and, and even different sexes have a different incidence of colon cancer depending on whether it's the we call the right side of the colon versus the left side of the colon. So just to try and make that clear for people listening, when I talk about the right side or the proximal side of the colon, it's it's the first part. The small intestine dumps its contents into the uh, to the large colon on the right side with the cecum, which if I put your hand on your abdomen, it's the right lower part of your abdomen. And then it comes up as the ascending colon, goes across as a transverse colon. That's all sort of considered the proximal colon. And then it goes down, so it descends, <laughs> descending colon. And then there's a S-shaped piece called the sigmoid colon. So that's the distal colon. And there's a difference. So I, and one of the things I read was that black people more commonly have it on the on the right-hand side of your abdomen, if you will. And I guess part of the problem of finding it is that when you do colonoscopy and other studies, and it's a little harder to get there and to identify, and maybe it's a little less co- uh, prone to symptoms because the, the contents at that point are more fluid or more liquid, and, and hence not symptoms of the obstruction occurring. So Absolutely. So it's complicated, and, I, and it's a, a lot more. You kind of think, well, it should happen equally in all parts of the colon, and Clearly, it's more complicated, like everything in life, as we learn more about it. Um, so let, let's maybe talk a little bit about the symptoms of, of colon cancer. Yeah, and maybe and can, can we just uh, take a step back, maybe, because we we're talking about risk factors. Okay. And the, the one thing that I will mention is there are certain hereditary forms of colon oh, cancer yes, yes, that, are, that are quite rare, but increase your risk of developing colon cancer quite significantly. And I think... Um, Bill, when you mentioned there are certain things you can control and certain things you cannot, unfortunately, we can't change our genes. Right, and right. certain individuals are born with changes in their genes that make their risk of colon cancer very, very high. And those are rare, but it's very important for us as doctors to be able to identify those people because it, we need to screen them very, very aggressively. And when it's hereditary, that means it's something that's present in every cell of a person's body, and so they can pass it on to uh, additional generations. And very commonly, I see individuals who are young who have a very strong family history of colon cancer, and it hasn't been identified. And if we had known, we might have been able to start screening them early and potentially turned a very serious cancer into a non-cancer or perhaps a very early cancer. And so those, those, uh, identifying those, those individuals is, is very important. Yeah, I'm glad you pulled me back to that because that, that's a really key one. And, and there are syndromes, um, Lynch syndrome, I guess, is the biggest yeah. one to, be, to talk about, but there are others as well. And where you have um, abnormal genes that don't allow you to repair the damage of, that's naturally happening to us uh, every day or having genetic changes that our body somehow figures out to repair, <laughs> But if you have a inherited uh, abnormality in certain genes and you don't do the repair mechanism properly and then you get accumulation of mutations and, and, and get an earlier cancer in the colon. Um, so in, in those cases, it's really important to identify because, as you say, then screening earlier in life would pick up the changes and, pot- and potentially lead to a much better outcome. Correct. Yeah, so that's a, uh, thank you for bringing that up because I wanted to touch on it and uh, I managed to glance over it. <laughs> so, and then shifting to the signs and symptoms of colon cancer, which are, I think are particularly important to talk about today in, in part because we're going through this pandemic and I worry that there are people out there who have been afraid to go and see their doctor or afraid to go to a hospital and may be sitting at home with some grumbling discomfort in their their belly today or some change in bowel habit and so let's let's talk about the signs and symptoms and if you're listening and you have any of those symptoms please go in and and see your doctor uh, about them so over to you in terms of what are the most common symptoms that people will present with yeah and i think this is an area where 
you describe the location of colon cancers and, and the symptoms that patients present with often does vary depending on where in that colon the, the, the cancer is. And so with the more distal cancers that uh, Bill described, you can sometimes see blood in your stool. And, and I would just say right off the bat, anytime you see blood in your stool, that is, that is something that you need to seek immediate medical attention for. It might be something as simple as hemorrhoids, but don't bank on that. If you, if, you, if you see blood in your stools or your stools are black, so the color of coal or you know, a dark black color, that, that's something that needs to be dealt with. Another common symptom is a change in your bowel habits. If you're a fairly regular person and suddenly you are not and you're having a bowel movement every two or three days and you're very constipated, or you were very regular and you're having a lot of diarrhea, so altered bowel habits are a common symptom. Um, we will see many individuals who end up with anemia, so that is when you have a lowering of your red blood cells and people will become very pale, um, and that is often due to blood loss from the GI tract. And so a lot of times if we see anemia, that is a red flag that somebody might potentially have an issue with colon cancer. I think there's a particular concern in the, in the elderly, right, that they just become anemic for no obvious good reason, Absolutely. and then they may well be slowly bleeding a for little sure. bit from a bowel cancer. Individuals can have, obviously, abdominal pain, so pain in their abdomen with the cancer. Um, frequency, where they're, they feel like they, they went and they have to go again. Mm -hmm. um, that's something called t tinismus. So these are, these are some of the, lo the local symptoms that, that we would describe. There's quite a lot of different symptoms, but I guess fundamentally, if your bowel habit changes, Absolutely. it's it's critical. Or if you see blood, or it, as you said, looks looks dark from blood mixing in with the feces. And I guess another one, if it's really low down in the rectum, the, the stool may actually become narrower in, in time, just because there's a smaller uh, space for the stool to pass through. So if you had any of those symptoms and you saw your doctor, what would the doctor likely do? What would be the diagnostic tests that were Yeah, going? so I think it's really important that there's a difference between screening for colon cancer, which we're going to talk about later, and investigating somebody for a possible colon cancer. And so in an individual who presented with symptoms like that, um, you know, almost always, if, there, if the suspicion is high enough, that, that individual will have a colonoscopy, where they will be sent to a specialist, who will use a camera uh, that's on the end of a, a very small tube and actually have a look directly into the colon. That is really the, um, the gold standard in terms of ruling in or ruling out colon cancer. Um, there will be other things. Obviously, they'll check your hemoglobin to make sure you don't have anemia. Um, they would do additional blood work. Uh, there might be CT scans or ultrasounds. But in terms of actually making or ruling out a diagnosis, that is a colonoscopy. So that's the gold standard, and because yes. you could visualize it, and importantly, you can take a biopsy, right. and that will provide the information as, as to it being a cancer. And and I guess um, really what follows after you've got the diagnosis is what we call staging, right? right. And maybe it's important for people to understand when we talk about staging a cancer. What what do we mean by that? Because sometimes your doctor will come and say, "Well, you got stage two disease," or what does that mean? For sure. So I think. Um, it's probably uh, interesting or relevant to the listener to understand if you've been diagnosed with colon cancer, what are the steps that usually need to be taken? And so many times if you've been referred to a, a doctor who does a colonoscopy, they, they may or may not be a surgeon. And so often once a diagnosis of colon cancer has been made, and most times it's obvious just by what the, the colon looks like, they will take biopsies to confirm it. But very often the doctor doing the colonoscopy will know purely based on the, the look of the colon. And they will take some biopsies, um, do some blood work, and that will usually at that point uh, initiate a referral to a surgeon um, who will ultimately likely be involved in removing the colon cancer and some additional, as you mentioned, staging tests. So in addition to blood work, it is really a standard practice now to obtain a, a CT or CAT scan uh, of basically the body from the base of the neck all the way down to the to, to the to the pelvis, um, and that will often be done to help um, determine how advanced the cancer itself is, but also to determine if it has spread anywhere. And <clears throat> colon cancer has almost a logical kind of spread, doesn't it? It uh, does. Uh, first through the wall, and the muscle of the bowel, uh, then to lymph nodes. Um, and then through lymph nodes and or 
uh, blood vessels to, to the liver, lungs, and to the surface lining of the inside of the abdomen. We call the peritoneum. There's a lining membrane, so you can get little deposits there, even in places within the abdomen like the ovary. So all of that has to be understood um, to, to shape the, the treatment approach. And I think maybe we'll just take a brief break here and then we'll come back to talk about treatment and then we'll come back to screening, which we've touched on. We've been hanging that carrot out for a while, but we'll talk about that at the end and uh, we'll be right back, so don't go away. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous supporters, the Hutton Family Fund and Banco Creative Studio, who make the Cancer Assist show possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has not stopped cancer. Instead, it has added to the isolation and challenges already faced by cancer patients and their families. The Cancer Assistance Program remains committed to providing free, essential support to cancer patients in our community, whether it be transportation and equipment loans, personal care and comfort items, to parking and practical education. With no sustainable government funding, we need your help so we can continue to be there for those who depend on CAP to stay safely at home. Individual and corporate support of signature events, third-party fundraising, and financial gifts are greatly needed. Visit cancerassist.ca to see how you can make a difference in the lives of cancer patients and their families. Well, welcome back. We're talking to Dr. Kevin Zabuk, who's a medical oncologist at the Jurabinsky Cancer Center here in Hamilton, who uh, specializes in managing uh, colon cancer, rectal cancer patients. And I should have mentioned as well, um, Kevin has a special interest and knowledge in cancer genetics, and I think you probably realize that because he talked about um, uh, the various genetically um, genetic predispositions you can have that lead to colon cancer. So, um, Kevin, we were starting to talk about uh, treatment in relation to the stage of disease. So, what we want to do is find colon cancer at the earliest possible stage when it's just really hardly invading into the wall. And we, I guess that would be a stage one. And the typical surgical, a typical approach, I should say, <laughs> would be surgery. Correct, yeah. And, and very important, when a colon cancer is picked up uh, at stage one, the, the likelihood of cure is well in excess of 90%. So the chance that you will be cured with surgery alone with a stage one colon cancer is very, very good. And this is what you want people to know and understand and why it's so important uh, to, to uh, get to a doctor early or, more importantly, try and deal with any risk factors you have or uh, enroll once you're at appropriate age in a, in a screening program. But after stage one, we move obviously to stage two, and that's when it's gone right through the full thickness, I think, of the muscle layer of the bowel. So now the prognosis gets a little different, a little less good, um, but the management's still basically surgery, right? To remove the disease segment and some normal bowel on either side of it and, uh, and the lymph nodes that it would drain into. That is correct, yeah. And I guess surgeons uh, these days can do it either by an open operation, like basically as it sounds, uh, probably a, a midline incision and, and just uh, a better view of the abdomen, but the results with so-called uh, laparoscopic surgery are essentially the same in terms yeah. of outcomes. And surgeons who uh, do that kind of surgery, it amazes me they can, but they're basically watching the thing on TV and yeah. operating with little instruments and can remove the diseased bowel out through a, a small incision in the abdominal wall. And the recurrence rates and, and, and so on are, are similar, and survival outcomes are similar. Um, recovery times a little less, and the trauma to the person's a little less. But I guess things really change at stage three, which now involves lymph nodes, and maybe talk about that and how treatment might uh, be altered. Right. So um, taking a step back with some uh, more high-risk stage two cancers, so um, probably beyond the scope of our conversation to get into a lot of detail about that, um, but some stage two cancers can have a fairly high risk of, of coming back and in those patients, uh, I'm a medical oncologist. I administer chemotherapy. Um, we will sometimes give people with stage 2 colon cancer chemotherapy to try to prevent the cancer to come back. In stage 3 cancer, we will almost always offer it to individuals. Right. So with stage 3 cancer, where the cancer has spread to lymph nodes, um, those, that makes up the vast majority of people that we would treat 
with what is called adjuvant chemotherapy. And adjuvant means that it's being given in addition to the definitive treatment. So in this case, the surgery is the definitive treatment of the cancer, and we're giving chemotherapy to try to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. And in stage three disease, where it has spread to those lymph glands, um, as long as a patient is well enough, and as long as they are willing, we will almost always offer those individuals chemotherapy to try to decrease the risk of a, a recurrence. So let's drill down a little bit on that. When we talk about chemotherapy, that often kind of makes a lot of people nervous. And I'm sure you see that in the clinic um, because of the fear of adverse side effects. So uh, what drugs are involved? What kind of side effects uh, can they have? Are there any other adjuvant therapies apart from the chemotherapy drugs? Yeah. I think um, it's a very good point that you raise that um, people have often thoughts about what chemotherapy is based on experiences with friends or family members. I think it's very important to realize that there are many different types of chemotherapy used for many different types of cancers, and they all have different side effects. Um, and so I think when individuals are afraid of chemotherapy, sometimes part of the way we reassure them is that every treatment is different, every person is different, every cancer is different. And so, um, for example, in the treatment of colon cancer, individuals do not lose their hair with the chemotherapy. And with some other cancers, it's almost universal that they might. Um, we have made great strides, I think, in supporting people while they are receiving chemotherapy. And so we have very good medications to try to prevent nausea and vomiting. And those have improved dramatically. So uh, another kind of thought that people have when they think about chemotherapy is, I'm going to be sick the whole time. And we have very good ways to try to prevent that. It's very important that people know that and that they not um, <laughs> delay getting to treatment or accepting treatment because of these fears. Uh, I think one of the things I used to do when I was in practice was just tell them, you know, everybody is different and let's try uh, the treatment and uh, see how you tolerate it and we can adjust either the treatment itself or the supportive care drugs that we're giving to try and find what works best for them. And I think most times you can work it out so that it becomes quite tolerable to, to take treatment. And as you say, the, the drugs that are available today to control nausea and vomiting, diarrhea and so on are so much better than certainly when I started practice. Absolutely. And, and the drugs you have as chemotherapy really have changed um, because up until about the year 2000, I think it was just had one drug, 5-fluorouracil, which That's correct, I yeah. used a lot of when I was younger. But now there's quite an addition to the, uh, the armamentarium. There is, call yeah. With that, that is useful for colon cancer. For sure. In the, um, in, the, in the adjuvant setting, when we're trying to help people be cured, we tend to still use the drug 5-fluorouracil that you mentioned. And we will often add a drug called oxaliplatin, which is a newer drug that was developed um, a few years after you had uh, stopped working. Um, and that, that is the cornerstone of the treatment of, um, of uh, curative colon cancer, is those two drugs. And we will often give uh, between three to six months of treatment. That's important to know that um, you know, it's not indefinite. You know, it, it is for a defined period of time, three to six months, which most people can get through. I guess the one thing about oxaliplatinum is it can cause what we call a neuropathy, so that can be a bit of a problem, but that reverses over gradually over time, does it not? Yeah, this would be another area where I think we've made headway over the last few years. We used to routinely give six months of chemotherapy, and if you give six months of chemotherapy, the majority of people will still not have a problem with permanent neuropathy, but about 10% of people will. And what we're, we're learning now is that for many patients, not all, but for many patients, we can actually have very good outcomes with three months of chemotherapy. So not only do you cut their, their time on chemotherapy in half, their risk of developing permanent neuropathy becomes much, much lower. Well, there's something I definitely didn't know, and that's yeah. kind of nice to know that, For sure. uh, that the amount of adjuvant therapy has been, been decreased by yeah. that amount. And, and so that would be a, a step that we really like to see where we're, we're looking at, uh, we have good outcomes, but we have a, a side effect, neuropathy, okay. that... Um, we're not happy with the, the number of people who suffer long term. Yeah. So how do we deal with that? And we deal with it with, by trying to, to, to cut back on the chemotherapy or de-escalate right. and with, with the same outcome from many people. So that's been a, a very big change over the last few years in my practice. So then you get to, I think we get to stage four now. Um, and, and here we have 
the probability of disease in the liver because that's sort of where colon cancer first likes to set up metastases, but it can be in other places. And now you most commonly will need systemic therapy, although sometimes it's just a few isolated areas of metastasis, which opens up the opportunity for more localized therapies to treat those isolated um, metastasis. Maybe we talk about that first and then a bit about the drugs that we use when it's more widespread. Yeah. There's no doubt that when patients have stage four disease or, or spread of their cancer to another organ, it's a much more serious situation. And the chance of cure is is much lower. But I think it's very important to realize that some individuals with stage four or metastatic colon cancer are still curable. And the scenario that you set up is the the very classic example. The, the liver is the first organ that sees the blood that comes from the colon. And so that is often the first place that the, the cancer is gonna set up when it spreads. But that also offer, offers an opportunity for it to stop there and not get into the rest of the bloodstream to go elsewhere. And so we have been pushing the envelope with our surgical colleagues at offering patients removal of those tumors. And the surgeons have also become much better at what they do and can remove more and more tumor while leaving enough liver behind to still function. And so that has become very important. And as a a non-surgeon, as a chemotherapy doctor, Whenever I see somebody with stage four colon cancer, one of the things I always try to take myself through with each patient is, is there a chance that this could be removable? And if I have any hesitancy, I think it might be, then I'll refer them to my my surgical colleagues for an opinion. I think we always have to think about that option. Well, if there's any chance of cure, that's what people will want to to hear about. And uh, and I think my understanding is that, that surgical skill in managing metastatic disease of the liver has been improved with, I don't know, greater understanding the anatomy and the lobular nature of the liver and what you can resect and what you Absolutely. can resect and so on. So it's been quite a quite an advance. And of course, the support of care postoperatively has become much more sophisticated, allowing people to get through major surgeries like that. For sure. Um, but if there's no chance of resecting it, I suppose one other area for resection is a isolated met- metastasis in the lung, because the lung has got a fair bit of extra tissue if you've That's looked right. after it over your lifespan and yeah. haven't smoked. Um, that that you could, if there's just a few nodules, that it could be removed that way. Absolutely. But when you're dealing with a multiplicity of places, then you're really your hands are tied. You've got to use systemic therapy or drugs to go through the whole Correct. body. Yeah. So what are the, the options They are first line um, yeah. for treatment? So we will often use very similar drugs in patients with more advanced disease as what I described in patients with curable disease. And so it is often going to be a combination of drugs. Um, we will use 5 fluorouracil which you already heard about, uh, with oxaliplatin, or if not oxaliplatin, another drug called arinotecan. And in occasional cases, we might even use all of those drugs together. And so we have many different options. There are many different cocktails that can be used. These have interesting uh, acronyms, full fox and full fury and full fox. Fox. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's a harder one to say. <laughs> and then and in addition to that, you have targeted agents. And I think this is a really interesting aspect of, of colon cancer therapy. But it's also part of lung cancer treatments and so on. Understanding the drivers of, of tumor cell growth. And... Uh, for the listeners, you have to think of the cell having little receptors on its surface and then uh, growth factors that are kind of like a key going into a lock and then turning the lock and driving the cell to produce more cells. So we have these growth factor receptors, we have growth factors, and then we have substances that inhibit them. So they're targeted to these receptors, some of them anyway, and then sometimes the pathways that are stimulated by those receptors. And that's become a part of uh, the management of colon cancer as well. Absolutely. So I think um, the field of oncology is really moving towards more precision care, as you've described, Bill. And drugs like 5-fluorouracil, oxaliplatin, arinotecan, they're more traditional chemotherapy agents that often try to kill off cells that are rapidly producing. Um, but they're not as selective as you describe. And so a big move in all of oncology is to move towards much more targeted therapies. And we have um, two big targets in in colon cancer. So 
we have something called the vascular epithelial growth factor receptor that we have a target for, and then we have the epidermal growth factor receptor. And, and so these are growth receptors. They're proteins that sit on the surface of the cells. And when cancer, colon cancer specifically in this case, when those uh, cells start to grow, they rely heavily on those receptors to grow. And so if you block those, you can help uh, block the growth of the cancer. It's really a, a nice bit of sophistication to cancer treatment, as you say, Absolutely. precision oncology you know, instead of the, the chemotherapy, which many people have come to think of as kind of like a sledgehammer to <laughs> affect because it affects normal cells as well as the abnormal cells, whereas this is affecting predominantly the, the abnormal cells in a selective way. But, and so there's been a, an interesting proliferation of drugs. Uh, uh, cetuximab and penetumumab and bevacizumab, all these things with MABs on the end, which are mean they're monoclonal antibodies. And I guess people are getting used to hearing about monoclonal antibodies in the context of a pandemic and so on. For but sure. yeah. but um, they're a very important part of the management of, um, of many types of cancers, but particularly here in col colorectal cancer. Um, now, some of the decision-making for patients is complicated, and, and one of the things I think people uh, would like to know about is how decisions get made. Is it by an individual doctor deciding these things, or are there uh, tumor boards or case conferences where uh, things are discussed, like when to decide on a surgery for a patient sure. who's more complicated? For Absolutely. Example? Yeah, I think in colon cancer, we our volumes are very high, and so I, I, I would, would not say that we discuss every case at Tumor Board, but if there is any uncertainty about the right direction. For example, if I see a, a standard stage 3 colon cancer in a 55-year-old, it's pretty clear what I'm going to do. But if there's a 65-year-old with two liver metastases and I'm wondering about resection, we will always bring those patients to a Tumor Board. And, and a tumor board where we have surgeons, radiologists, pathologists, um, chemotherapy doctors, radiation doctors, nurses, pharmacists, all discussing the case and coming up with a consensus about the best treatment. And we, we as you know, Bill, we, we use those very heavily in Hamilton. And not uncommonly, we might present a case at more than one of a tumor board, you know, at GI rounds and then again at hepatobiliary rounds that focus on the liver. I think these things are really important for people to know about because, frankly, in the past, uh, medicine was sort of practiced almost privately. You went to see a surgeon who made the decision for you, and uh, you then were referred perhaps to a radiation oncologist who made a decision kind of in a vacuum with their knowledge of the use of their modality, or you got referred to a medical oncologist who also worked in a kind of vacuum. That was the early style of practice when I began in oncology, and I'm so pleased to see the evolution to these multidisciplinary case conferences because then you get so many more uh, perspectives on a given case and experience uh, because everybody brings, every practitioner brings their experience uh, to bear, um, and it can really be helpful in the decision making. So one of the things I really wanted to bring out in this uh, podcast is just how that's pretty commonly done in Ontario. It's very much done here in Hamilton because uh, there are, there are um, multidisciplinary case conferences for all the different tumor sites uh, in, taking place uh, in the cancer center so that patients are getting multiple opinions, not just a single practitioner's uh, opinion. So it, it, it's just a, st a change in practice style that's happened over the recent uh, decades, and, and it's really a very um, positive one that... Uh, it's good that patients know about. I, I do feel patients often feel very reassured when we when we tell them explicitly that we presented your case. These were the people who were there, and this was this was the the, the consensus. They they feel like they got a built in second, third, fourth, fifth opinion. And I guess it avoids those second opinions where you feel like I need to get in my car and drive down to the cancer center in Toronto yeah, or in London or something right. because. I've heard uh, from uh, a variety of uh, physicians and surgeons right here who have uh, excellent knowledge, and, and this is the, their consensus, so they're reassured. Well, let's um, talk about screening. Yeah. Uh, such an important aspect of um, 
of, of care. And, and again, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, the screening programs for colon and breast and uh, cervix, I think they've all taken a bit of a hit uh, everywhere because uh, resources have had to be moved. Um, so I really want to stimulate people to think about um, getting back uh, to, to awareness of screening and taking advantage of it if they're in the appropriate age group and have the appropriate uh, level of risk and so on. So let's define what that is. Right. So, uh, you know, screening for colon cancer can be carried out in a variety of different ways. I think we're going to talk about the main one that's utilized in Ontario. And so screening is a, a way to detect a cancer before it's symptomatic. And so at a population level for colon cancer, in Ontario, we start screening at the age of 50. The most common type of screening is the fecal uh, immunotest. And so this is very easy. It's very convenient. There is a lot of stigma associated with screening for colon cancer, but because it involves the bowel and, you know, perhaps the... Uh, the inconvenience of somebody having a look up with a camera, but the, the most common screening test that's available to all people in Ontario over the age of 50 is a, a test on your stool. And so you, you get a kit from your family doctor's office. If you don't have a family doctor, you can actually write to Cancer Care Ontario and they'll mail you a kit. And in the comfort of your own bathroom, you take a little bit of, of, of stool or poop and you put it on a stick and you mail that in and what they're looking for is they're looking for traces of blood. And traces of blood on that test will uh, get you hooked up with a, a specialist who will do a colonoscopy. And I think it's critical that we all screen starting at the age of 50. Even if you feel you're healthy, you don't have any symptoms, that's why we screen. It's because um, early cancers bleed a bit, and even polyps, polyps can bleed. They do, yeah. So that, that puts the blood into the stool, but it might be at a level, microscopic level, that you can't see with your eye. We talked earlier about seeing real blood in the stool in the, or in the toilet water um, or mixed with the stool. But that's when there's a lot of bleeding. But this is when there's just sort of microscopic. And so that means also the test needs to be done on a number of consecutive days, does it not? Like, are we still doing them three consecutive days? Or no, is it just one just with, one the day. fit? with the fit? Also, that makes fit. it easier yeah. with fit. Because with the FOBT test, Correct. which was a chemical test that reacted and identified the hemoglobin, it was three uh, three consecutive days. So that makes it easier for Yeah, and, it, and this test is more sensitive as well. It, yes. it has a higher chance of detecting a cancer when it's there. So then um, if... So that's average risk. So anybody over age 50 to 70 yeah. should be having this done on an annual basis? Every two years. Every two years, yeah. okay. And, and then if it's positive, you get referred to someone who's going to do a colonoscopy. Correct. And we talked a bit about colonoscopy, that you obviously there's a preparation for it. It basically cleans you out, and that's a pro perhaps the worst. Well, I'm not sure it's the worst part of it, but <laughs> it, it does empty you out and, and get the colon clean, which is very important because... The uh, endoscopist, the person doing the colonoscopy, has to really be able to see all the folds of the colon while they're doing it. If it's obscured by the presence of stool, then it may miss a cancer, so it's very important. And it's also important that the operator, the person doing it, really be skilled, eh? because this isn't exactly simple test, mm -hmm. uh, having had a couple of them <laughs> and having watched the TV screen. Um, the, the, the ability to negotiate the turns in the colon. We talked about the different um, uh, parts of the colon, the ascending colon, the transverse, and the descending. Well, there's some right angle turns that are a little hard to negotiate, um, but are, can be done. You want to see the whole colon, and then you want to see all the folds as you're bringing that scope out. So you can't go too fast, you can't go too slow. You've got to, experience tells you what the right speed of withdrawal is to be careful to see even the what we call sessile polyps, which are quite flat and, and fairly common in the right colon. So, yeah, there's a lot of aspects to that. There used to be flexible sigmoidoscopy. I don't know whether that's still being done in Hamilton or not. Yeah, so, you know, um, Bill, I think you allude to the fact that there are, there are a variety of very valid ways to screen for colon cancer. And so in Ontario, for the average risk person, we're going to talk about the non-average risk person in a sec, it's the fecal test, but certainly colonoscopies um, in many other jurisdictions, like in the U.S., very common that the col colonoscopy itself is used for screening. 
And there is, there is data on using a flexible sigmoidoscopy, so a, a much shorter scope where they just look at the most distal part of the, the colon, the bottom. And there are a couple, a couple small pockets in Hamilton where there are nurse practitioners who are doing that. But I would say it's a fairly small number of people screened that way in Ontario, but still very valid. And all of these tests have been shown in studies to actually improve survival. So they are very powerful screening tests. That was the point I wanted to make, is that the, the screening with flexible sigmoidoscopy, I think, was the first to show that there was a survival Correct. advantage, and then there have been trials since then yeah. on colonoscopy. So it, 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 it's, it, and it's interesting because it's not only detecting cancer early, I want to make this point, but it's finding those polyps, mm -hmm. removing the polyps, then you don't get cancer. That's right. So it actually has led to a decline in incidence of colon cancer in some jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. As a, as a result of having effective um, screening programs in place. And we just hope with the pandemic and the sort of the delays in getting people back into screening programs, we don't see, you know, an uptick in the number of more advanced colon cancers as a result. Um, so we mentioned the provincial program, and it's been active, I guess, in Ontario for, what, 10 years or at more least, now? At least, yeah. And, um, and Colon Cancer Check is the name, and Cancer Care Ontario is the, the agency of government that's been operating that. And um, if you're 50 years of age or older and you're in this province, uh, make sure to, to uh, get your every two years FIT or FIT test. Yeah, um, and if you don't have a family doctor, they'll still send you a kit. So um, you can do this without actually being linked to a family doctor. That's how important it is. And then you mentioned that there are people who are higher risk, so right. those are people who are going to get screened, and let's talk about those folks. Yeah. Too. So th this really is where I had mentioned the first-degree relatives with colon cancer. And so if you have a first-degree relative with colon cancer, uh, and once again, for you that would be brothers, sisters, mom, dad, or, or your children, um, you are eligible for, for higher risk screening. And that's where we go to colonoscopies. And those are done either every five years or every 10 years, depending on how young the individual was who was diagnosed in your family. And so because these individuals are all higher risk, uh, we want the most sensitive test, uh, the, the test that has the highest chance of picking up a, a cancer or a polyp, and that is the colonoscopy. And so are there special clinics for people at high risk? Uh, yeah, so those individuals uh, with family history can still be referred to anybody who does uh, endoscopies. And so they, they go through the, it's uh, still part of the colon cancer check program. It's just an aspect that uh, bypasses the, uh, the FIT test. Mm -hmm. And then for individuals, these very rare individuals who have genetic conditions, we screen them very, very aggressively. And so... The one that you mentioned is something called Lynch syndrome, which is the most common form of hereditary colon cancer. And individuals are often diagnosed with colon cancer very young. The, the mean age of diagnosis is in the late 30s or early 40s. And so for those individuals, uh, they do need to be seen in a specialized genetic clinic. But once that diagnosis is made, we actually do colonoscopies every, every year for these individuals usually starting around the age of 25. And so they end up being screened very, very aggressively. And even in that rare condition, we have data that it's, it, it improves survival. So I think um, screening for other types of cancers is a little bit uh, more complicated, but the data with colon cancer is very clear. Screening has always been effective. Then there's some other um, rare, but not, nonetheless very important, um, diseases where you have multiple polyps, eh? familial adenomatous polyposis, terribly long name, yeah. FAP for short. <laughs> but I've, I've seen pictures of colons taken out of people, and like there's li literally thousands Correct. of polyps in, yeah. in these individuals. And I guess the only treatment there is to remove the, Correct. the, the, the colon and to, uh, if the rectum's preserved, to just keep uh, checking it for uh, occurrence of, of polyps. A lot of fascinating illnesses, aren't there? Um, and, a, and a lot of things that have actually uh, come along to make the um, outcomes for people with these diseases better, finding them earlier, uh, treating them better with uh, um, localized therapies or, or systemic drugs and, and many more drugs uh, at the hands of folks like yourself in the clinic. 
Are there any last messages that we should deliver to people listening about colorectal cancer or things you'd like to reiterate just to drive home the... Yeah, I mean, I think I've said it a number of times, but I would end with um, get screened for colon cancer. I, it, I, I, it's incredibly important. It's very effective. I do think there's a little bit of a, a stigma or a little embarrassment sometimes about screening for colon cancer, and we've got to get past that because um, it, it can save your life. And so I'm 50 now, and I plan to do my first fit test this year for sure. Well, been there, done that, and I've had several colonoscopies under my belt for Thanks, screening man. too, so I can attest to, first of all, the importance of it, as uh, Dr. Zabuka has said, um, and also that it, it's a little uncomfortable, but it's no big deal. For sure. And, and if something that can prevent you getting a, a cancer is definitely worth doing. So I'd encourage, as Dr. Zabuka has just done, all of you listening to, if you're over 50 um, and this the average risk, get out there, get your fit test, and and or colonoscopy, depending if you're listening in the United States. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, people listening to the show, but I also very much appreciate Dr. Zabuk giving his time and his expertise to the Cancer Assistance Podcast today. So hope you'll enjoy the podcast or have enjoyed the podcast and that we'll uh, have you back listening in another month's time. Bye for now. This has been the Cancer Assist Show, brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program. Thanks for listening.